Welcome to Mindfulness Manufacturing. My name is Trevor Blondiel. Spending 25 years in manufacturing, I discovered the real impact we have on turnover, communication, and the ability to manage change is how we show up. That's the essence of emotional intelligence. In each episode, we bring a guest or message to expand your skills, engage your people, and grow your organization. So let's jump in. In manufacturing, we're seeing core values of companies get off the plaques of the walls and into the behaviors of the organization and the language. Yet we know this process is not easy. In particular, you know, if your company has been around for a while and you're working to make a shift. So I brought in another expert and friend, Adam Hill. He's a keynote speaker, a nine-figure CEO of a manufacturing company, best-selling author, and host of the top-rated podcast, Flow Over Fear. He helps leaders and high achievers rise above Love fear and realize the ultimate potential in leadership and life, taking as manufacturing lessons. Welcome, Adam. Hello. Good to see you, Trevor. <laughs> so <laughs> I didn't even know many Ironmen. So Ironmen are people that have ran 26 plus miles, uh, swam, what, two and a half, 2.4 miles? Yeah. Yeah. 2.4 miles, uh, 112 mile bike, and then a 26.2 mile marathon all in one day. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so I go back to episode 109. I had Stephen Pivnik on here who you and I and Stephen all kind of met together. And all of a sudden I'm meeting all these Ironmen and also CEOs of manufacturing plant. So who else ever to have on the podcast? Not that I've done an Ironman. I do like to exercise every day. And, uh, and, and your whole story is just fascinating. And I've read your book, Adam, and the fact that, you know, you did this Ironman um, after getting sober. How many years sober now? I have 12 years sober now, back in January. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. And that is amazing. And watching and working with uh, with my son, who you've heard his story. And uh, mm -hmm. on February 26th, he was three years sober. That's so fantastic. Uh, I, I think when you're, you know, I haven't gone through what you've gone through, but I can just living vicariously through my son, Dyson, definitely have a admiration for you, Adam, and, and everything that you, you've done and, and how you how you're a good, great example for others. Thank you. And congrats to your son. That's it's an amazing <laughs> achievement. I, yeah. I mean, having come from that background and knowing that, you know, that, that, that you, there's a time where you feel hopeless in life, where there's no, where you feel like there's no opportunity or no way forward for you at that mm -hmm. moment. But knowing, you know, where I am now, and I'm guessing where your son is now, it, it, it demonstrates that there's hope beyond hopelessness for anybody that feels that. And that's like the primary message that I want to share with people is that there's hope beyond that hopelessness that you're feeling. Yeah. Just stick, stay there, stay in it, you know? Yeah. And I think I would give the same advice to manufacturing plants that are looking to change their culture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, we, and, and you and I got into the side discussion. I said, man, I got to talk to you about this on the podcast. I mean, you've got, you've got the credibility because you've been in this family business for over a hundred years. Well, not, you haven't been alive for it all, but you, you've been, you're attached to it. And, and you started talking about core values and sacred cows. And I was like, oh, tell me more. So let, let's, let's start with that. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I believe that, you know, companies thrive on core values. I mean, we all know that when we're, when we're working in a business, one of the first things that we want to do to establish our credibility and our legacy and everything that we want to become as a, as a company, as an entity is establish core values. Like, you know, the things that we're going to live by, the things that are going to guide us to the next level and to the destination that we want to get to. But within legacy companies and what I've found, you know, working in, in, a, in a company that's over 100 years old and has been around for a long time is that if we're not careful, a lot of times those core values that we have that are our driving forces can often turn into sacred cows, things that are more restrictive, things that may be unnecessarily restrictive to the growth of our business, meaning we close our minds to new opportunities mm -hmm. because we think we have to hold true to these things that we think are values, but really they're just veiled sacred cows that we might need to get rid of over time. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I believe that we just have to be, as we continue to build our legacy, we have to be fluid and nimble enough to really ask ourselves those questions. Are we really living true to our core values or is this becoming a sacred cow that we need to address? Adam, you're a wonderful storyteller. I've heard you tell stories and you know that's how we learn. So as much as you can share with the audience, so what have you learned through your company? Like what what was this? How did you... How did you make this change or recognize this? Yeah. So when I, when I first entered into the role, so I entered in the company 20 years ago and, you know, working for a family business, um, a family manufacturing business that has, has existed for generations. I grew up in this business. So I grew up 
seeing my dad, seeing, you know, my family members, my siblings go into the business who are all, you know, older than I am. And, uh, and so it became a part of my, my psyche growing up. It became a part in, entrenched in my, you know, in my, uh, in my soul, like what, how this company ran. And I, you know, remember just the seeing the good things that were coming from it, because, you know, as a kid, you don't, you don't really hear a lot of the, I mean, you hear like some of the minor complaints or anything like that, but you get kind of shielded from like the real challenges that are faced in in the company, right? Um, so I grew up hearing like a lot of this really good stuff that was happening and all of the greatness that came from mm-hmm. Hill Brothers and, and, and our company that that we, um, where we, uh, uh, and and what we were what we were doing. And so when I entered into the company, um, you know, at a low level and and working in, I became sort of exposed to what our core values were. And and those core values were really that we took care of people, that we that right. we were caring and compassionate, you know, that we uh, um, that we were safety centered. We were really, you know, sa- focused on safety, focused yeah. on service. And ultimately that part of that legacy was, you know, it was founded on, on big dreams. But I also found like over time, as I, as I, as I looked into it, there were a lot of, a lot of those sacred cows too, that were like, you know, well, well, we have to hold on to this particular ideal. Like we have to keep, you know, maybe these certain people employed because they're family members or, or, oh. or they're, or they're this, or we, uh, or we have to continue on in this line of business because it supports one of the founders visions for this type of business. That's not maybe not making us money, or maybe it's a little yeah. risky. And so we learn about that. And then, you know, the younger generation starts asking why, yeah. and the response we often get <laughs> is what I mean. I think we all know this from any legacy business. That's the way we've always done yeah. it, right? It's not broken. Don't. <laughs> yeah, it's not. You know, don't try to fix it. Right. Yeah. And so, so it, it that kind of language where that's shut down by by maybe maybe the um, uh, generation that kept that going and not and it's no knock on that generation. This is this is what happens in legacy bi- businesses. Mm-hmm. We grow a specific type of business in in any business cycle you grow a type of business, it peaks, it plateaus, it becomes something solid and that's kind of where our mindset stays around that piece of business. But then as it starts to become like, you know, as it starts to, you know, maybe not do as well as it used to, or it becomes, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 you know, not, not the greatest business in, in the world. Well, then we, you know, we kind of keep our mindset there, especially when we hold fast to it. And that's where yeah. it kind of becomes a, a sacred cow. We hold on to these old ideals and we don't, we don't have the, we don't make the changes that we need to make. So, uh, so I think it's, 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 it was important when I took over, um, you know, the company in 2018, and it was very, very difficult, you mm-hmm. know, was to find a way to address those sacred cows, those challenges that we were facing, and the change that we needed to make while keeping the integrity of our core values, and the nature of the founding mission of our business, which was to stay caring and compassionate. I mean, those are yeah. great core values, stay caring, and compassionate, focus on service, you know, be a safe company. Those are Great and and those are forever kind of values. Yes, but those those sacred cows we needed to we needed to address them, and so we put the systems in place. It wasn't easy, but it never is an easy process. But it's worth it to really honestly address those sacred cows. And then I love that phrase, and I want to start using that because I'll I see them everywhere now. Oh my gosh, there's another one. But I heard from another manufacturing leader that explained to a group culture versus strategy mm-hmm. and that your culture may stay the same because you're going to care about people and safety. But like when you get a different CEO, like when anyone came in in 2018 for you, yeah. uh, the strategy is going to shift and that's okay. Cause we need to continue to be nimble with the environment. Uh, but some of the culture foundations that got us here, th- those need to stay. How does that resonate with you? Yeah, I think, I think that kind of establishes it perfectly because we, we tend to confuse, I think, culture and strategy strategy. Like we, we tend to think that, uh, and while, while there's kind of a Venn diagram overlap of them, we think that there's like a, that they're just one big consent, big circle that we, mm-hmm. that, uh, that we have to follow, but, but they're, but they are often, you know, kind of shifting things, especially, especially the strategy part, but the culture shifts as well. I mean, the culture changes. And if we're not, if we're not nimble enough to really change, even as slowly as it may be with the culture, that's mm-hmm. uh, that's evolving around us. You know, we're going to be stuck in those in those old ways. I mean, that's you know, it, it's just not tradition. I mean, whereas like in our company in the 1970s, maybe they would have whiskey for you know whiskey 
lunches <laughs> and things like that. That's just not the way we're going to do things anymore. I mean, that's not the, that's just not the way the business is done. So we have to continue innovating. But uh, and so that those pieces of the culture, we have to, I believe, start. And I think the core values are a good place to start with that mm-hmm. is start with what you will always represent. And, you know, I think that's why the core values are sometimes kind of kind of very high level, kind of 50,000 foot, yeah. like we're going to be a safe organization. Well, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, that may mean something different tomorrow than it does today. But as long as we're on that founding vision, we'll keep adjusting and evolving into that and sticky, staying true and staying um, uh, and, and, stay, and staying true to the integrity of that value. Uh, I think where it becomes a sacred cow is when it is when we, we become stalled in what we think that value represents mm-hmm. and we just stay there like, oh, safety means that we have to have a, um, you know, that, that we have to have the safety department structured in this exact way or this exact function um, in, in order to be successful. And, you know, 30 years later, you might still be in that in that structured that way, but it may not may not work in today's environment where things have evolved. Yeah. And I think that's what I'm resonating with when I listen to you, Adam, is we got to pivot, but mm-hmm. in certain areas and some some areas with strategy and with how we do things. And it's because some good examples of the whiskey at lunch. I think of the uh, toolboxes with the centerfold on it and the ashtray on the side. <laughs> like, you know, that's that's just not OK anymore. Right? right. We know more about smoking. You know, we know more uh, just about how we impact each other with our behaviors and what does that represent if you've got that all over your toolbox like i remember yeah. having conversations with people it's like well why can't i have that on my toolbox and it's like well yeah we're evolving <laughs> right like we still you know that core value of treating each other with respect hasn't changed mm-hmm. but now when we dig deeper into like how does this make each other feel and we use that f word in manufacturing feel and mm-hmm. and uh, it's like well okay well we didn't really think about how that might make someone else feel and you know that's 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 not okay to have that on the toolbox and we just got to have that conversation and i still see companies today that haven't really evolved past that yeah yeah, and it's it's true. I mean, in, in a lot of cases, in those legacy industries that or legacy businesses that you might be in, a lot of times that when the world revolves around around that company, and you bring new people in, new ideas in, you, you're bringing in a new generation of people who are who who are attracted to the values of the company, the the values that that you have. But they're then they're being immersed in kind of those sacred cows a bit, where as like the the sacred cows at one time, like say it is smoking, you know, having having an office where people where there's a manager who smokes for the entire. And by the way, we came from that up until <laughs> probably the 20 teens. We had we had that uh, very situation, wow. and you know where where you know where we have that in the office, and these new people are coming in and thinking to themselves, <laughs> how is that still allowed? Yeah. And they're not really empowered to say anything about it because it's been that way for 50, 60 years, right? So that's kind of that culture is there's this silent majority that comes in that's thinking this isn't right. Mm -hmm. They're not empowered to say that. They're not empowered to speak up about it and share their ideas and say that things have changed because they might offend that one person who's been here for a very long time or a very, uh, and so that's kind of where that conversation I think needs to shift. And we have to create a safe place for that healthy conflict to arise. So how about this saying, of, <laughs> this just cracks me up because it's like, well, that's, that's just how Trevor is. Like he's yeah, just, right. he's just like that. Right. Is that a sacred yeah. cow? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, imagine the trouble that can get you into it, depending on the nature of the question or where, where that's coming from. Oh, yeah. you know, that's just, that's just uh so-and-so being so-and-so that's just yeah. Joe being Joe or whomever, yeah. you know, um, really, I mean, think about how that minimizes the impact of somebody who's actually bringing a legitimate claim against, you know, that person. I mean, I think that's where the, the processes the the current processes around how we're doing things that includes like your HR processes, your safety processes and all that kind of stuff, because that can get down to a really, really unsafe environment in the manufacturing industry. We, we deal with hazardous chemicals all the time. Mm. And one of those sacred cows in 1980 or 1990 might've been, I don't want to wear safety glasses while I'm, while I'm unloading ammonia. And at that time, maybe it was uh, okay to do that. But if you do that now and you get injured, then that's a big, no, no, that's something that has to change. And regardless of who you are, you need to be held accountable to the standards of of that safety requirement. 
because that's just the way things evolve. So I'm curious because I've seen owners of plants mm -hmm. that they don't really have as an owner and especially, or maybe as a CEO, general manager, sometimes your accountability <laughs> is not as high. So you maybe get away with something once in a while. How did yeah. you deal with that transition? And, and have you had those challenges? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, those challenges still do exist. And, and, you know, for the first few years in, in this role where I was leading the company, it was, it's very challenging for me to speak up because as, as someone who is, is speaking on behalf of the company and the evolution and the changes that we need to make, it's often difficult to change the opinions of the current ownership structure in a family business that is, you know, part of the previous generation that thinks yes. that kind of has that mindset of, you know, this is the way we've always done things and this is the way things should go. Um, and in that, in those instances, it's where, you know, it takes, it takes courage and it took a courage. Uh, it it took a long time for me to really lean into this courage. And it's something that I that I still struggle with today yeah. is, you know, is is embracing that. But one thing that I found is that is that the system, if you can build a system uh that that promotes the the proper kind of change and the proper channels for this, like that 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 actually serves as almost a buffer for that decision making, it helps to take some of that some of that weight off of those decisions off of you as the leader or as me as the leader. Like we implemented EOS, which is the entrepreneurial operating system a few years ago. Yes. And it was one of the best decisions we've made because it allowed the current leaders of the organization to come together and talk and have this safe place for, for healthy conflict around our core values to really discuss them. Are these still the right core, core values? Mm. Are these still the right things that we need to need to address and and talk about those changes. And then it gave us the courage to make those decisions around a system, took the weight off of me as the decision yes. maker on that, that I wasn't changing some sacred cow. I was simply saying, this is the way we're evolving. And now we're on all on the same page about it. And yeah, did it, does it kind of rub the ownership or the previous generation the wrong way? Sometimes. Yeah. yeah. But you know, that's, that's, okay. that's what we have to lean into. It's yeah. healthy conflict. Yeah. 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 And Patrick Lencioni talks about that, right? You can't have good conflict without some trust. Obviously, you guys have that. And yeah. I, I love the fact of how you phrase it, Adam. And I think this will be helpful for the listeners is it took it off your back, right? Because sometimes we feel like it's personal. Adam's yes. driving this, you know, wants to make his mark and we got to deal with it this where in reality if we can make it hey let's just have some conversation and you know i like conversation and coming at it from curiosity of just like hey i'm wondering what's holding you back from looking at this change and i like to say that if we're sitting there in a room and we're both sitting in a chair and there's an empty chair it's like it's you and it's me and over here this is the problem that we're talking about or this mm. is the behavior that we're talking about and how often do you take it back to your core values and say, if you look at that problem and say, well, how does that affect our, if we were to make this decision, how does that tie into our core values? Are you guys actually saying that? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So we have to, we, we take those core values that we have and we basically reward uh, or we're structured around rewarding and, and creating consequences around those core values, hiring and firing based off of them and creating, you know, our evaluation system around those core values. And I do like, I know there's a kind of a controversial phrase that's, uh, uh, or, or saying that's out there that says, um, you know, hold your ideas uh, firm or something about like hold, uh, holding strong ideas like loosely or something mm -hmm. along those lines. I just butchered that. I apologize. But, <laughs> but the, the idea being that, you know, you have these core values that are guiding, but you still hold them loosely that you're willing to ask yourself, are these still the right core values? So when you mm -hmm. say yes, okay, so for the next quarter, before we discuss that again, or for, or for however long it is, we're going to firmly, you know, run this business based on, based on those core values. And, um, and, but we're going to keep asking ourselves in that structured fashion, are these still a core values that really run our business? And are we sure, are they really running it? And what's the evidence behind why we need to be that? What's the advantages that, that that mm -hmm. gives us? And, and, uh, or are they becoming sacred cows or are we developing sacred cows around that? Interesting. If, you're listening and it's like, okay, well now I can frame it a little bit differently on how do we get it off the plaque? That's what we started with, right? Like how do you get yeah. it off the plaque? Well, I like the whole, you've given us some structure here, right? If I'm running a plant, I'm thinking, yeah, I probably need to talk to the team about are these core values still working? Mm -hmm. And if we're not talking about them regularly to make decisions, then what are they there for other than right. the plaque, <laughs> you know, that 
Because I look at oh, you've got core values. Yeah, check that ISO checklist off. We got core values here. High five. Uh, worked with a plant that uh, helped them create their core values. And I was just talking to the owner last week. And they are still making decisions off those core values. Mm -hmm. And they actually made them with the, the current team that they have and had some input. And it was a really great experience. But I said, man, you got to keep got to keep using them because I'm using you as an example. And and it's and it's working right. It's how they built their company. Yeah. And they, they really don't need to change. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I have an interesting story about um, about how we got to our core values, our, our recent core values. And so when I came on board, the core values that were written on everybody's uh, business cards were integrity, quality, safety, service. Mm -hmm. And as, as we went through the years, it was just like, yeah, integrity, quality, safety, service. Like it was always reinforced, but it was, there was never really a structure of discussing, discussing it or, or figuring out the, 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 how we, how we live by those or how, how that works. And so when I was in that role, you know, a couple into my roles, years into my role, even as CEO, I was like, I'm not touching those because they were a sacred cow at that point. Uh -huh. And so I wasn't touching <laughs> them. But then like when we got into, you know, building the systems around it, I actually, I finally asked the question, how did we come up with these? And digging in, I, I discovered that one of the second generation leaders back in the 80s, like in the 1980s, had just said, well, we need something to uh, to put on our marketing material. So he just came up with it on the fly <laughs> and it stuck. And so that's how honest. it became. Yeah. So there was no so there was no structure, yeah. no process behind it. It just became what we stood for. And, and that's when we got into the discussion of, all right, we're starting from scratch. What do we really represent? You know, yeah. and and yeah, service and safety stuck. I mean, because those are key elements of our business that we have to be good at. We have to excel at those because we're in the safety business. And and then we found, well, no, we're, you know, integrity is just kind of like an, an all-encompassing buzzword kind of thing. So what, what do we really do? Well, we're caring and compassionate. What what makes us that? These these specific things. Well, we're, uh, you know, we're service centered. What does that mean? You know, well, we, we do focus on service more. That's why we can, that's why we can expect a premium from the market rather in this commodity based environment. And, um, and yeah, we're creative problem solvers. That's another thing that helps us to build that value into what we do. So it helped us to really redefine those and we can shape those going forward. And I think we have a good story for how we develop them. And so that the next generation can take it and make it their own because it doesn't have to be, you know, established and, you know, it, it, it's something that you can hold softly and, and, and evolve with. Uh, you want to build them for a hundred years, but you want to give them the ability to evolve over time. Yeah. And I'm sure there's a lot of people that can make chemicals. Yeah. Right. And this, it, it sounds, it's complicated to me, but I know there's other chemical manufacturers and how do you separate yourself? Right. Mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't take a lot to make yourself 5% better than everybody else, but it's got to be something. So you guys have kind of found your way through your, your service and your creativity and your problem solving to kind of yes. say, Hey, this is what, this is how you stay in business for a hundred years. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's 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 kind of a, a magic to legacy businesses, and um, and it's it's no it's no secret. I mean, they dream big. They're they're big dreamers, and uh, you know they have the ability to evolve over time. You look at all of the legacy businesses; they are they have the same spirit of the founders, but the structure has changed, has evolved over time to become what they are today. Ford Motor Company, for example, you know, uh, or, um, you know, the, the, any, any of the big, the company I spoke with yesterday, uh, First National Bank of Omaha started nice. in 1857, six generations. Nice. And, um, and they still have that same spirit of service and dreaming big and mm. helping their communities. And you could see it in just in the spirit that they are. That's where court values come from. It's in the spirit. Those sacred cows are more on the surface, the scary things we just don't want to touch, the untouchable yeah. stuff, the conflict that we want to avoid. Mm. You know, you have to go into that dark forest from time <laughs> to time. And, and you're right. It is the conflict and we need something safe that newer em employees or newer members of the organization can ha have a conversation and say, oh, that's interesting you see that because mm -hmm. you just went through what our core values are and what they look like so you can identify them. Mm -hmm. And then this is how we discuss it. So when we say, hey, uh, the way Adam's kind of rolling this out, I don't like it. Well, mm -hmm. that, that's not helpful. <laughs> that's an opinion and we know what those are like. But if you can say, hey, you know, when you think about the core value of this and the way that Adam just rolled that out, I, I'm a little, I want to understand that better because I, I don't see the correlation. And then it's like, oh, great, let's have a conversation. And then that, that may provide a little bit of conflict, but now you're kind of separated, right? We're, we're conflicting on a thought process and maybe I can learn something from you. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it's, it's almost, it, it, I think the, the when, uh, when we make the, the process of, you know, decision-making difficult, 
because we make it personal. Mm, and I know that yes. this is a hard balance to strike um, because business is personal. I mean, despite yeah. the fact that we say that we don't want to, this is not personal, it's business, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah, business is personal, but it's personal because we make it personal. And I think if we have to individually and we have to, as a team, agree to make that, create that safe place where we're not going to take things personally and just get to the root issue and just get mm. curious into that issue, then we can get to solving problems. And then, you know, then it gets the right kind of personal. It makes the business yeah. fulfilling for all of us. And we don't build that resentment. We don't build that, that um, you know, the challenges and we make it just a, and that's where healthy conflict, I, I think is, is bred, but we just have to remove ourselves from making it individually personal for ourselves. So good. It's just because it's like, I, if I'm a listener, I'm sure you're feeling what I'm feeling as Adam's talking, which is like, oh, I had that this week. I got some feedback about a speaking presentation from a few years ago and it was like okay the ego is just soaking that in right and it's <laughs> like oh <laughs> but that was a trevor from three years ago and i gotta accept where i'm at now and you know when you get in those conflicts and it starts taking it personally and it's really got to kind of separate that from like that's not my identity and mm -hmm. and this problem at your manufacturing plan is not your identity. Yeah. And and if we can just kind of shift it the way you said, Adam, when we hear Adam Hill, what do you want the listeners to talk about today when they walk into the plant and they heard your voice? Yeah, I, I want them to get curious. I think curiosity is an, a genuine curiosity, not curiosity out of spite. There's a big mm -hmm. difference. But uh -huh. I think that curiosity is so important to driving us to the core issues that we need to solve and that we might be avoiding and turning into sacred cows. Be, have the courage to be curious. And to those leaders that might be hearing those questions, have the open-mindedness to listen to them and, you know, embrace the the journey to that unhealth, to that healthy conflict that might drive to the solution you want to find. Curiosity. I love it. We come with that attitude. We can connect the top to the shop and uh, we, we say it in such a way that is okay, right? When you come at it, like I love what you said, with the curiosity. Mm -hmm. uh, and hey, that's how we learn. And I learned from you today, Adam. Thanks so much for coming on, brother. Trevor, my honor, man. Thanks, buddy. Hey, folks, appreciate you taking the time to join us today. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with someone. Haven't subscribed yet? Do it now. Remember, if you want results, the key is increasing your awareness of how you show up.